So in this tutorial, we are going to be talking about some of the basic operations that we have in you. During my search for this topic, I came across a GitHub repository where I found this function. And what this function actually does is to check if a number is prime or not. The simple algorithm behind this function is to check between the number of 2 and the half of the number that we are testing and to see if the modulus is going to be 0 at any point. In order for us to understand how this function actually works in details, I have separated all the opscode that is being used within this function. So here we have the add operators and the division operators and so on. So we are going to be checking them in details. Please take note, you'll write every operator in the form of a function. So for any operator that you are going to be using, you are going to be seeing them declared as a function here. So we have a function that actually adds A and B together. So let's test all these functions that we have here before we test the above function. We deploy, we check the adds function, 4 and 4 together, it's going to give us 8. So we also have a function here that divides B by A. So it returns 0 when B is greater than A. So we have 8 divided by 4 here. So it's going to return true. But when B is greater than A, it's going to return 0. And we have a function here that checks if A is less than B. And if A is less than B, it returns 1. And if otherwise, it returns true. So we have 100 is less than 1000. So it's going to return 1. 100 by 100 is going to return 0. And 100 is less than 1000. So it's going to return 1. And when 100 is greater than 90 so it's going to return zero and we have a function here also that check modulus so it checked the modulus between a and b so we said 100 by 9 the modulus is going to return one because if you divide 9 by 100 what you will get is a modulus that is returning that is remaining one also we have a function here that check if a is zero or not and here i've already written if zero is zero then it's going to return true. So what this function actually does is checks if the input, which is A, is 0. Then because 0 that we input is equal to 0, so it's going to return true. And previously, we've learned about what will be inside the byte text 2 when a statement is not true. So since we are checking if A is 0, and because A it is 0, the length of a byte text 2 will not be 0 indexed by because once it is 0 indexed by, that shows that the statement is false. So we check if A is 0, so what will be our check for 0 is going to be true. So in order to explain this better, I've already created a function that returns the byte 32 of what 0 we actually looks like. So we input 0 here, and it returns a byte 32 that ends with an index of 1. We now check if 2 is 0, because 2 is not equal to 0, so it's going to return false. So 2 is not equal to 0, it's going to return false. And what will be the byte 32 of when we pass in 2 is going to return a 0 index byte. Then in order to proceed, we have a truthy and a false statement here that we declared. So what this actually does is to check where all the bits inside the byte 32 is not 0, then it's going to be true. And here, because all the bits inside the byte 32 is not 0, because this is not 0, so it's going to reinitialize the result that we've initialized as 2 here to be equal to 1. And where all the bits inside the byte 32 is 0, is going to be false. So because it is false, it's not going to initialize this function here. So we have this falses function here that returns 1 because the result that we initialized previously, we set it to 1. And if it is true, we now set it to false. And we have is true this statement here that returns 1 because if all the length in the byte 32 is not 0 index, then it's going to reset it back to 1 from the 2 that we previously set it into. So we have another negation here that checks if is 0 is actually 0, it's going to return true. So if is 0 is 0, it's going to return true. And because it is true, which is it's going to reinitialize the result keyword that we have here and set it to 2. So we check the negation. So it's going to return 2. But if we change this is 0, and we put 2 here, you can imagine what it's going to return. It's going to return 1 because the 2 bytes of this statement is just 0 index bytes. So we have a function here also that checks the maximum between x and y. It returns the max between x and y. And here we check if x is less than y, what do you think is going to return? Previously, we've checked less than if 100 is less than 90, it's going to return 0. And if 90 is not less than 100, it's going to return 1. You can just imagine what will happen here. If x is less than y, then it's going to return the maximum. So that shows that x is less than y and the return is going to be 1. And because it is 1, all the 32 bits 
that we have in a 32 byte will not be equals to true so it's going to return y and here also it checks if x is less than y and the output is not equals to zero that shows that we are going to be initializing x as our maximum the reason why we are doing this is because in u we don't have a statement so any statement that you want to declare you have to explicitly initialize them because in you we don't have else statements so here we can now check the maximum between 100 and 10 is going to return 100 what if we have 10 and 100 is going to return 100 still because it takes precedent of the highest number proceeding to switch statement now just to get the lesser value of these two numbers so here we switch between x and y and if it is true just doing the same thing it returns else if it is false then it returns y so here we check switch between 2 and 4, 25 and 4. So it returns false. What if we have 4 and 25? It still returns false also. So because there is no while loop in assembly language, but for loops can be written so that they behave like a while loop. Just like in every programming language, for loop in you has a header that has three components. We have the initialization component, we have the condition component, and we have the post iteration component. So how do we make this function as a while loop? We have the initialization that can be initialized to zero. So we have the condition statement that we want to check for every time i is less than 10, then we increment i by one. As you will see in while loop, while i is less than 10, which is what we have inside the condition here, the result will be incrementing. So what we now have is we add the results with the i that we've already made here. So if result is 2 and i is equal to 2, so it's going to be 2 plus 2. So that will, the result is going to be 4. So once result is 4 and i is equal to 3, it's going to be 4 plus 3. So just like how while loop actually works. So by the time we check while, the result is going to be 45. So coming back to our expiring function, this might look a little bit funny because you might be expecting to see something like this. We check the half, we said x divided by 2 plus 1. So, and because you will actually write every operation in the form of a function, so what we did first is to divide inside an add function before we now add one to it. It's not because the division actually takes precedence of this add. So the next thing that we now have to do is the initialization function. We check from two of every number down to the half of the number that we are testing. And inside the if statement, we now decide to check the modulus of x, which is the number that we are testing, and the i, which is the iteration, if it's going to be zero at any point. Then we now have to reinitialize the p, which is our return value. So a zero index byte. Then we break out of the loop. That shows that this is the prime number. So let's proceed to test. We test value of 100 and we check if it is prime, it returns false. What if we test 101? We test if it is prime, then it returns true. What if we test 56? We test if it is prime and it returns false. What if we test one for the last time? We check if it is prime and it returns true. So if you notice, all we've been doing in our assembly block is how to read a local variable that is declared within a function. So in our next video tutorial, we are going to be checking for how to read data from slots and how to write to slots.